Welcome everyone to the last session of day one of the PRM. Um, good to see you all joining us here. It's nice to see so many of you still around for this last session. Um, so this is the Learning Lab. Um, for this session, we will have French translation available. However, sign language uh, will not be available on this session. Um, and as the previous sessions, please put any questions or comments into the Q&A. Um, and for now, I'll pass over to our hosts. Thank you, Katie. I'm just checking if you can give me a thumbs up that you can hear me clearly. <clears throat> Uh, warm Pacific greetings and welcome to the Learning Lab on Knowledge Brokering. I'm Nicolette Golding, people call me Nikki, and I'm the network facilitator for the Australia Pacific Climate Alumni Network, and I will be co-facilitating this session today. For the next 60 minutes, our main speaker, who I will introduce soon, will take us through what we hope will be an engaging session where we will together explore the concepts behind knowledge brokerage, including definitions, competencies, characteristics, processes, and the journey of brokering knowledge, which I'm sure, I'm very sure, you will soon see that many of you take almost every day. The climate knowledge brokerage journey is one that starts with information and knowledge that leads to climate action and is a time-sensitive decision-making process. We hope that by reflecting on your own competencies as knowledge brokers and by understanding the various stages of the knowledge brokering journey, that you will leave this session with a greater appreciation of your own competencies and the journey of knowledge brokering so that you can enhance your abilities to identify opportunities for better information and knowledge synthesis and translation and dissemination and your ability to make critical decisions that are tailored for the Pacific. <clears throat> During this learning lab, we invite you to interact with us via Mentimeter polls, using your phones and laptops if you have access to them. Um, the links and codes to access this platform will be displayed on the PowerPoint and also be shared in the chat. And we very much look forward um, to your active participation and uh, this opportunity to learn from one another. Uh, we also invite you to raise your hand and come on stage so that we can see and hear from you directly. It's a bit lonely being here and just being the only ones to just talk, so we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, if you're in the hubs without access to devices, we encourage you to share your responses with your hub facilitators who we hope will be able to input your feedback into the chat. Um, in terms of the outline of this session, we'll first go through a brief background of the Pacific Climate Change Center, which has a key function for supporting knowledge brokerage in the region. Uh, we will then move um, on to a brief inter introduction of the knowledge brokerage journey, including key definitions and processes. Following this, we will look at the characteristics and uh, competencies of a Pacific knowledge broker, and then we'll end with looking at the knowledge brokering journey and go through a brief mapping exercise. And then Rachel will also wrap up the session for us. Um, so now I'll uh, introduce our main speaker for today, Ms. Rachel Crichton, um, who is the technical advisor for information, knowledge management and brokerage at the Pacific Climate Change Center, um, based at um, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environmental Program. So handing over to you, Rachel, to start us off today. Thank you so much, Nikki, um, for the warm welcome. And if I could just take a moment as well, um, just to get a show of hands, if everybody can hear me well online and um, my connection is not fuzzy. Um, okay, I see a couple of hands up, so that's good. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for confirming. Um, look, I've just I've just been watching um, the attendees come in, and it's so great to see so many so many familiar names um, and so many people from around the region, especially um, tuning in um, from the national hubs. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you again, um, Bulavinaka. My name is Rachel. Um, I'm originally from Fiji and currently serving um, as the technical advisor on information, knowledge management and brokerage um, at the Pacific Climate Change Center. Um, as Nikki mentioned, um, this learning lab, what what we'll go through um, throughout the duration of the session um, is something that you're probably already familiar with. 
um, and that you do on a daily basis. Um, but it's it's really just trying to pinpoint um, areas for self-reflection and, and self-improvement um, along the journey as well. Um, so again, just a, um, just a quick uh, big shout out to all the national hubs. Um, I was down at the Samoa National Hub this morning um, supporting the team down there for, from MNRE and really good to see um, so many national hubs online and, and so many people um, joining in from around the region. So again, welcome. Um, thank you, Nikki. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So my my the first few slides of this presentation is really just to um, give everyone um, a brief overview of the Pacific Climate Change Center. Um, I am aware that um, some of you are familiar with it, um, but of course, for those um, who aren't as familiar as the others, um, please just allow me this time to to go through it. Um, so the role, um, the Pacific Climate Change Center, or the PCCC, as it's most uh, commonly referred to, is a regional center of excellence for climate change information, research, capacity development, and innovation. We are hosted at SPREP in Apia, Samoa, on the beautiful Vailima campus here. Um, the center was established in 2019, so we're still a fairly new um, center. The center is also a partnership um, between the governments of Japan and Samoa, so <clears throat> also acknowledging um, Samoa's instrumental role in setting up this center. Um, it is funded, <clears throat> excuse me, it is funded um, under grant aid through JICA for Samoa as a host country of SPREP. Um, and since a couple of years ago, its operations have expanded with the support from the governments of New Zealand, Ireland and Australia. Thank you, Nikki. On to the next slide, please. The PCCC has various core functions and themes. Um, so we have four um, different functions at the PCCC. So um, one is, of course, on knowledge brokerage. Um, I am the advisor that handles the knowledge brokerage um, aspects of the center. <clears throat> we, we also have advisors that handle um, the other three um, components, uh, sorry, the other three functions of the center. So applied research, capacity building and innovation. Um, just highlighting a little bit on knowledge brokerage and how we kind of fit into the um, the PRM and the PRP um, technical working groups as well as um, really trying to build those partnerships between knowledge producers and knowledge users, um, looking at translation and synthesis of climate change information that can inform um, that can inform um, decision making on the ground. Again, looking at coordination and promoting um, knowledge brokerage across the region. We have um, four cross-cutting themes at the center. These are climate science and climate services, climate change adaptation, mitigation and low carbon futures, as well as climate finance. Thank you so much, Nikki. Next slide, please. The next slide um, that will be shown um, is actually just, um, just a slide uh, for your information. We do have a partnership framework for knowledge brokerage in the Pacific, and this is how um, we look at engaging um, with our member countries across the region in terms of, in terms of this work with the overall goal um, that Pacific governments and stakeholders receive timely, robust um, information in user-friendly formats. Again, to ensure that, um, you know, whatever information and, and knowledge that is passed down um, is able to, to then be used in decision-making and, and action processes moving forward. Um, if you'd like more information on this, I'm happy to share more. Um, also, just letting you know that um, the PCCC has a booth um, on, the, on the platform as well, and I'd be happy to, to sit down with anybody um, if they have any further questions on this moving forward. Thank you, Nikki. So before we get um, into the real uh, details of this presentation, we'd really like to know from all of you, um, and as Nikki mentioned um, at the start, um, this, this learning lab is designed to be extremely interactive. So be prepared, please, to um, bring out your smartphones, bring out your tablets, um, use your laptops as well. well we, we will be running um, several um, exercises and, and polls on, on Mentimeter. So we hope that um, you'll be able to use this moving forward. Um, also just like to note that the code is the same um, for each of these exercises. So don't don't be stressed in thinking that you have to, you know, change back or do something else with it. It, it, it will be the same um, throughout this whole session. So um, to, sorry, Nick, if we just go back. Um, so there are two sections. Um, there are two, two questions that will be coming out of here. How do you understand, do you understand what it means to be a knowledge broker is the first one. 
And the second one is what are local terms you would use to refer to a person who is a knowledge broker? Okay, so I see in the chat box that we have um, a couple of uh, people asking for the code. Um, so just letting you know that Nikki has actually um, posted the code as well as the guiding questions in the um, in the chat. Um, so please, if we could just um, uh, ask you all just to to access the the Mentimeter using these um, using the code, please. Thank you. So I see three of you so far um, have said no. One has said yes. One has said I think I do, but I'm unsure. All right. So I think we'll give a couple more seconds for other people to to respond to this all right seems like we have six seven sorry nine <laughs> that have said um no not really sure um what it means to be a knowledge broker that's fine um we're getting a few more responses in terms of yes i think so not sure um okay so i think 20 people um have responded so far um, so we have a bit of um, an even-ish, or maybe not now. <laughs> I think I do, but I'm not sure. Um, really, we're we're trying to um, we're trying to gauge um, as much as possible before we go into um, into the bulk of this session on on what you might already know. Um, for those of you that have answered yes, um, please just bear with us because um, this is meant to be a learning lab for everyone. Um, and, you know, we we also understand that part of being a knowledge broker is that continuous learning as well. So um, perhaps we'll stop here since we've had um, 23 responses so far. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what are some local terms you would use to refer to a person who is a knowledge broker? So what are some local terms you would use to refer to a person who is a knowledge broker? So just remember that the um, the code is the same and you should be redirected um, to, to the next question. Okay, so we have some coming in. Well-connected, networker, that's great. Do you have anything in local languages from around the region that could describe a knowledge broker from what you might already know so far? Okay, great. We've got advocate, connector, info, information specialist, extension officer, advisor, coordinator, facilitator, someone who translates information into knowledge, great. The gatekeeper of information, <laughs> consultant, that's great. Liaison officer, advisor. All right, so we're getting quite a few responses in here. Thank you so much. Um, Nikki, sorry, do you think you could just scroll down a little bit on the Menti exercise so we can see the others? All right, interpreter, knowledge manager, translation and exchange, researcher, Okay, we're getting 19 responses. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. I know it's the end of the day in most countries. Well, at least at least in Samoa, it's almost 4 p.m. here. So um, just wanted to thank you as well for being so um, responsive on this, um, on this platform so far. All right, so we've had 36 responses. 36 responses, 22 people um, responding. If you um if you'd like to liaise with the people in the national hub um, that are facilitating at the laptops um, perhaps in the front, um, you can give your ideas to them. I know in the Samoa hub, for example, we had some post-it notes um, around the room this morning so that people were able to to write their comments on there. All right, we've had 40 responses so far. Okay, information hub, messenger, approachable person, team player to address issues. Okay, now we've had 42 communications officer, pastor, yep, very important, Taylor's communication, coordinator, knowledge management officer, very good, elders, knowledge bank, librarians, community, community facilitator, Taylor's communication. All right, so it seems, it seems like everybody um, is actually on the right track. Um, despite your responses in, in the first question, but that's okay. I mean, this is um, this is what we're, this learning lab is all about, you know, to kind of gauge 
um, what you might already know about the topic, but also to give us, um, you know, a bit of feedback in in terms of um, what we what the next steps of um, our engagement in terms of knowledge brokerage are throughout the re the region. Okay. So maybe we'll go back to the presentation now. We received 49 responses. Thank you so much, everyone. This is very, very useful. Um, okay, so just looking at um, an introduction to knowledge brokerage and key definitions. So a lot of people tend to tend to use knowledge and information um, interchangeably, but it's really important in this context to note that um, they're actually not the same. So in general, there are three conditions that need to be met for new information to become knowledge. Firstly, it must be comprehended. So the individual needs to understand the new information and it must be expressed in a known language. I think for all of us who are from the Pacific, living in the Pacific, this is one of the things that we can really identify with. A lot of our countries have hundreds of languages. And, you know, for example, in Fiji, we have many dialects as well. So trying to translate trying to translate terms that might not already exist or that might have, you know, very similar meanings um, to, to other terms or other um, concepts in our languages can sometimes be difficult. But really trying to ensure that um, we're communicating it in the best way possible. So again, in that known, known language. Secondly, it must be contextualized and it must make sense in, rela in relation to existing knowledge. So for example, the tropical cyclone season is coming up. We're already in October, right? Um, if I give you some information about the number um, of tropical cyclones we're to expect in the Southwest Pacific, um, you know, given their intensities and things like that on a piece of paper, you might look at that piece of paper and say, okay, but, you know, so what? I've never had any experiences with tropical cyclones in the Southwest Pacific. Um, I don't really know what to do with it. And, it might mean that, you know, I need to do a little bit more um, advocating, a little bit more trying to help you to understand um, why it's important. Um, but, you know, having having so having that sort of contextual or existing knowledge. Um, so say, for example, I grew up in Fiji and, you know, every cyclone season um, we put up shutters. That was always something <clears throat> that was always something that we knew to do um, when it came when it came close to cyclone season. Um, the third point is that the information must be valued, showing that the information is useful and can be applied. So, for example, if I give you, you know, if I give you information, climate change information, you kind of look at that information and, you know, ask me, but so what? You know, what what does it mean for my remote community in Vanuatu? Or what does it mean for my um, very large community, um, you know, in the highlands of, of Papua Guinea, for example. I, I, as a knowledge broker, need to be able to, to explain to you why it's valuable. So on to the next point, uh, which notes that there are different types of knowledge and power, and depending on the context, different types of knowledge may emerge. So I think um, a lot of what we've talked about um, in terms of knowledge stems from local, specialized, strategic, and holistic. So again, looking at um, local is community knowledge, specialized being the scientific knowledge, strategic is the political knowledge, holistic is traditional knowledge. But also noting this is not, you know, this is not an ex exhaustive list of what exists out there. These are just some examples. And, you know, also noting that different types of knowledge uh, may emerge as the, um, as the journey continues. Thank you, Nikki. Next slide, please. So maybe your next question is, so what exactly is the role and function of a knowledge broker? Um, I think a lot of the answers that came out of that last uh, Mentimeter exercise um, really, really put into perspective what you already know about knowledge brokerage and being a knowledge broker. Um, it's what I've defined here is someone who acts as a bridge between the information, the learner and the new knowledge. And you know, really acknowledging that sometimes this person also needs to go a step further and engage with decision making. So really turning that knowledge into action, um, which I really think um, in, you know, not not just in the Pacific, but um, it's a worldwide challenge is that this this is often the hardest part um, of the knowledge brokerage journey. Um, so I know this is going to be the first time that you're seeing this image here, but you'll see it um, later on as well um, as we do a mapping exercise. But um, I really want to, to note here that um, the, 
The knowledge brokerage journey starts with the information. There are many sources of information that you can get, um, you know, from from everywhere. You can get it from trusted government sources. You can get it from social media or you can get it from your next door neighbor. Um, but depending on what you do with that information that you received, um, will then turn it into to knowledge, which will then determine what your decisions and, and actions will be on the ground. Thank you, Nikki. Next slide, please. So we're going to go into our next um, set of Mentimeter um, exercises here. Um, but first, I'd really like to acknowledge, and I'm I'm happy to see the um, the national hubs in the Solomon Islands um, online because, um, and I hope there's a there's a very special person in that room there right now, Zelda Hilly, um, who um, who is actually who actually drew this. Um, this uh, interpretation of, of a knowledge broker and the qualities um, that she thinks that she has as a Pacific knowledge broker. No, sorry, that she knows that she has as a Pacific knowledge broker. Um, so if you just look, if you're able to see the image well enough, um, it says, good listener, courageous, big heart, nimble, tirelessly committed and enthusiastic, tactful, and able to negotiate with balance. So these are some of the qualities that Zelda possesses. And, you know, I'd really like to acknowledge her here, um, you know, and her hard work um, as part of her internship with CSIRO working on this. Um, you'll be able to hear a little bit more um, about the engagement that we've had with CSIRO in terms of um, manuals that we have co-produced. Um, but for now, we will go into our next part of Mentimeter exercises. So from this depiction here, from this interpretation here that um, Zelda has um, shared with all of us, what qualities do you think you have as a Pacific knowledge broker? And again, just noting that the link is the same, the code is the same. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and type in as many answers um, as you'd like for this. All right, teachable, adaptable, that's great. I've got two responses so far. Thank you, Nikki, again, for sharing the link um, in the chat. Observer, openness, yep. These are great answers. All right, we have eight responses so far. Let's keep going. 12 responses, very nice. Eighteen responses, <laughs> and um, and just to keep uh, noting as well that if you would like to um, put a response forward, um, but you don't have a device um, in front of you, you're welcome to to ask the um, the people who are in the national hub um, at the laptops to please um, input your answers as well. Thank you. All right, we're almost at thirty responses. That's great. Thirty-two. Sorry. <laughs> Thirty-four. All right, almost 50. All right, we've just jumped 10 over 60. Okay, we're getting a lot of really good um, responses in here. And it, it looks like it looks like this learning lab um, should just be a, a, an information session. <laughs> but it's it's really good to see this keep going. Um, I'm kind of wondering if we can get up to 100 responses on this. And by the way, it keeps jumping. I'm pretty sure that we might actually. <laughs> All right, we're up to 85, 87. All right, I see a lot of good words coming out of here. Learner, listener, humble, inclusive, approachable. All right, we've reached the 100 mark. Resilient, thank you. We have a comment. Okay, Nikki, thank you. Would, could there be another step close to decision around access to resources to enable action? Otherwise, great people, ideas, and information are stalled at that point. That's very true. That's very true. Perhaps that's something that we can discuss um, as we move along through the presentation, but we also note your comment. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we have 120 responses now. Um, so maybe if it's okay, we will jump to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are really enjoying the Mentimeter. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
So the next part is really looking um, at the characteristics and, and competencies of a knowledge broker. So again, um, we've put this slide, you'll see this slide um, for the next um, three slides, I believe. Um, and this one is just a blank one to kind of give you um, an idea of where you where you might think um, some where you might be able to input um, some characteristics and competencies around these two. Um, just to note that the main difference is that there are two different types of domains. Um, the values and purpose, relationships and networks, entrepreneurial mastery mindset are part of the characteristics. Um, looking at competencies, good with people, learning skills and adaptation competencies. So um, again, over the next uh, couple of slides, as I mentioned, um, we'll have an opportunity to discuss this a little bit more and give you some examples as well. Um, and also, also have another interactive um, uh, exercise towards this. Thank you, Nikki. Next slide, please. All right, so here we have the same slide, as I mentioned, a little bit more filled in this time. Um, so again, starting with characteristics, looking at what your purpose is, looking at what you value, your worldviews, how do you master things, how do you be self-efficient, how do you look at the relationships that you have and build off of them, looking at entrepreneurial opportunities as well. So some of the competencies, again, um, we've We've had, I think that was 129 or almost 130 um, responses in the last Menti exercise. Um, so again, looking at interpersonal skills, um, looking at lifelong learning, being open to things, having a general, um, you know, approach to things and ensuring that, um, you know, you take into account cultural sensitivity, especially in the Pacific um, looking at adaptation competencies. So these are some tools um, that we actually have um, as part of the manuals that I mentioned um, earlier that was done in partnership with um, CSIRO out of Australia, um, is looking at critical thinking, systems thinking, strategic thinking, future thinking, um, but also learning to deal with ambiguity or uncertainty. Um, so the next slide um, will actually show how it all comes together. And I think um, for the most part, if you can imagine this, um, Nikki, sorry, next slide, please. Um, if you could imagine these um, two circles that you have filled, now here, um, you can see as a bicycle. So um, I'd like to, <laughs> I mean, I'd like to do a virtual um, show of hands, but I, I know that's going to be kind of hard um, in this setting. But um, you know, we've all we've all at some point um, learned how to ride a bicycle, or we all at some point um, learned how to do something. You know, whether it's playing tennis or you know getting on a skateboard or something like that. Um, we all know and appreciate that it's very common to fall down, and it's very common to fall down and then realize, okay, you know what? Next time I get up on this bicycle, I'm going to be doing something differently. I'll angle it this way. You know, maybe I'll wear knee guards so that I don't have to, you know, bruise my knees so badly the next time. Um, so really trying to bring bring these characteristics and competencies together, um, you know, in a figurative way to represent a bicycle is that, you know, sometimes you don't have you, you don't have and you're not meant to um, have all of the characteristics and competencies listed here. Um, but what you can do is kind of, you know, ask people to to join you on this um, on this ride moving forward. Um, you can, you know, if you feel like your strength is openness and, and learning, um, but you know, you'd like to, you'd like to improve on, on dealing with ambiguity or uncertainty, um, you can reach out to your community and you can reach out to them and say, you know, do you have any tips or do you have any um, ways that you've dealt with this type of um, uncertainty before? So again, trying to get the bicycle to move forward um, might at times be difficult, um, but it's not to say that it's impossible. It can be challenging, of course. You know, you're going to you're going to hit that rock on the driveway and fall over. Um, you know, then you'll get back up and then you'll try again. And you know, you might have to swerve around your your pet dog at some point. Um, all these things happen, and all these things um, are kind of the challenges that we have to face um, in our lives um, on a day to day basis, but also. Um, you know, when we're trying to broker um, climate change uh, information and knowledge across the region. So I just really wanted to um, bring back to this point is that um, 
the line and the journey is never straightforward. Um, you know, you can start, stop, start, stop, go back um, a little bit. Um, but as long as the general m momentum is forward moving, um, that shows that there is progress um, in the activities that you're doing around the region. Thank you, Nikki. Next slide, please. Um, at this point, actually, um, I will pass over, I will pass back to Nikki, um, who will be uh, facilitating the next um, couple of slides um, on self-reflection and, and how you rate yourself across the different competencies. But um, back over to you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so what we're going to do next is a, is a self-reflection exercise. And I think we can all agree as, as knowledge brokers, um, it's really important for us to stop and reflect on ourselves and our capacities and our competencies and our ability to um, br better broker um, the knowledge and information that we have um, at our fingertips with others. And so what we'll do is that we'll, we'll do um, a Mentimeter exercise uh, where we'll reflect only on the competencies um, because your competencies are your ability to sort of act on your your characteristics. So we're only going to reflect on our, on your competencies and we're going to get you to think about to what extent do you agree or disagree um, with this, those statements and whether you have like, to what extent do you have those um, competencies and capabilities? So I'm just going to exit here and take you <clears throat> through to slide. And so how would you rate yourself across the different competencies of a knowledge broker? So in terms of being a knowledge broker, um, you need to be able to have general skills. And what does this mean to have general skills? It means you need to be able to read, write, um, operate standard software, for example, uh, email, Excel, and you have the, the following skills. You're able to um, manage, you have management skills, you have planning skills, and you have risk management skills. So if you go onto the, the Mentimeter, um, and I'm sharing again oh, with you, um, I hope you have, sorry, I typed in the wrong thing, but I sh thank you, Rachel. Rachel's put in the code. Um, to what extent do you um, agree or disagree with these things? So I see people, I see seven people already um, started in entering. Our next one is around interpersonal skills. So these are your social skills that enable you to connect with others, to build trust and social networks, to understand and work effectively with others. We understand, I mean, we in the Pacific know the power of the coconut wireless and your ability to tap into your networks and to get information that will help you to move yourself along. Like some Philip had mentioned, you sometimes you're stuck and we, you know, we take advantage and we we use these skills that we have around interpersonal to connect into our network so that we can move um, actions along. We also have um, <clears throat> the competency around learning. So be oriented to learning and having the skills to do so. Um, I remember in my high school, the motto was be lifelong learners. So as a knowledge broker, are you a lifelong learner? Um, and so it's really important for you to be able to have the ability to learn um, socially and to be able to criti critically um, reflect on on your skills and yourselves and what you're doing and how to do better. And this is where, you know, monitoring, evaluation and learning processes are really important in the projects and programs that we implement and having reflexivity. So how do you influence, you know, when you're working with different partners, understanding the different ways that you can influence decision making um, in a way that it makes it more effective. So I see we have 32, 33 responses um, <clears throat> to the Mentimeter exercise. And for those of you uh, who are in the um, hubs who don't have access to a device and cannot um, vote uh, and engage on the Mentimeter, I, I urge you to you know, maybe write these competencies down on a sheet of paper that you have and just really think about what, you know, to on a scale of one to five, how would you rate yourself? And then the rating is not important. It's more about the process of reflecting um, on these competencies. So thanks, I, we have 34, 34 people on there. We see that most people are at the higher end of the, the spectrum across all of those different competencies, which is awesome. And we'll just move on to the next one. Um, so the now we're looking at openness, ambiguity, and integration. 
Um, and so in terms of openness, do you have the ability to, or do you have the ability to cultivate an open mind and are open to new ideas, new worldviews, values, processes, and you see opportunities where others don't. I know lots of people when I'm sitting with them in a meeting, you can't stop them. They're just generating so many connections and they're so open to other people's um, reflections and responses and they take it in and they regurgitate it and spit out something that's you know even better. So you know, do you have that ability? Ambiguity, um, are you able to sit with this, the discomfort of not knowing? And are you able to help others to do the same? We understand what the science is behind climate change. We understand what the impacts would be on a broad scale, but we there's a lot of ambiguity on how that will affect different systems into the future. So are you comfortable with that discomfort? Are you comfortable with helping people manage that discomfort? And it's interesting to note in the, in the last slide, we had people rating themselves quite highly around 4.2 to 4.3, whereas around ambiguity, most people are rating themselves around 3.6. Um, so, you know, reflecting on what is challenging about not knowing. I mean, I know for, for certain that I would be on the lower end. It's very difficult to sit with the discomfort of not knowing something, especially if you have, um, you know, you have communities that you're working with who are depending on you to translate that information into actions and decisions that will help them. So it is something that's challenging to work with. Um, also then around integration. Um, do you have the ability to think differently um, and you have an understanding of different disciplines and are able to connect and accommodate the beliefs and knowledge of others? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we, we talk about people being experts. We have experts in, in different things. We have water security, food security experts. We have experts in oceanography. But um, one of the things that we, we see more now is the rise of the expert generalist. The person who has competencies and knowledge and understanding across different areas and different sectors um, and are able to you know, sort of create the connections between those things. So it's really great to see that in terms of integration, again, people are, who have um, you know, added to the, to the Mentimeter say that they, they rate themselves quite highly around 4.2 on that. So that's really awesome to note. <clears throat> So moving on to, to the other competencies, um, systems thinking, um, the ability to understand connections and feedback loops and drivers, scenarios of change and can identify intervention points. So, you know, thinking about, um, and, and Rachel will touch on this in terms of the, the journey of knowledge brokerage, as we go from information to systems, information gets even more complex the number of partnerships that we have to enter into become more complicated. Um, so the ability to understand the connections within systems and between systems um, is really important. Strategic thinking, planning and self-regulation skills. Do you have the ability to identify actions and take steps to implement as well as address barriers? And, and again, um, uh, Philip, I hope you don't mind the comment that you said is really important. Um, you know, it's really important to, if we know what to do, do we know actually how to get it done? And uh, whether you have the ability to do that. <clears throat> and then we also have future thinking, ability to anticipate what will happen in the future and help people to do the same and make practical judgments. I think in the last, um, one of the, the previous Menti slides, we talked about researchers, you know, the importance of research in terms of infu informing um, future thinking is really important and critical in terms of um, knowledge brokerage as well. So it's quite interesting to note, we have 23 people that have responded um, to this particular slide. Um, let's move up to 24. Um, but it's interesting to note that here, um, in terms of, you know, how people, you know, rate their, their capabilities here, it's slightly, slightly uh, lower than in the first uh, two slides. So again, reflecting on <clears throat> these skills and what are the things that we, we can do um, to be able to address and, and um, these particular competencies within ourselves and within our teams. Going to move on to the next one. So we're looking at critical thinking. So your ability to reason, 
um, have flexible thinking and you can shift from one perspective to another. I kind of like to think of it as having multiple tabs open in your on your screen and being able to you know go through all of them and sort of understand how they relate to each other, the different bits of information. Um, in terms of your normative ca capacity, your awareness of societal norms, you know, the rules or the standards of behavior and um, harnessing this understanding to enable social change. So we, in, in the context of the Pacific we were, and, you know, other, other regions, we're always talking about context matters, understanding the culture, understanding the traditions is really important um, in the work that we do around resilience. So, you know, ability to navigate these things are really important. And so we also have um, the next competency, which is um, entrepreneurial. So out of the box thinking, um, ability to see things that others don't, ability to engage in politics, and understand institutions that support innovation. So, you know, your ability also to see um, actors that are able to to innovate we often look at entrepreneurs as people who have that ability to in, innovate you know develop new ideas and act on on these ideas um so just looking at that slide we see that we have 24 people that have contributed to that so really thank you um to those of you who are engaging in this mentimeter exercise we really appreciate it and we hope that for those of you um in the in the hubs who who can't uh, do this with us that you're you know you're sort of reflecting um on those on your pieces of paper um yeah so it's interesting to note here that again uh slightly lower in terms of normative and entrepreneurial competencies um something that we noted um in the training with uh csiro um and in, in, in terms of being able to uh, roll out the training that uh, Rachel has mentioned. Uh, entrepreneurial competencies uh, tend to be one of the areas that people, knowledge brokers rank themselves really low in. So it's not something that you should feel like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know how to do this. It's, 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 a, it's a skill that not many people have. Um, so that's something uh, to note. The ability to innovate is, is you know, almost only 5% of people have that ability to do that. Um, so, yeah, thank you. We've got 31 responses to that. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, the end of, of that particular exercise. And I thank you all for, for contributing to that. And I hope that that was useful um, in terms of uh, reflecting on your your competencies and you know how you do what you do on a daily basis and you know what are some of the areas that you could potentially um, look at improving in terms of yourself and across your um, organizations if you were to do this within your organization. Um, something that we wanted to add here as well is that one you know, don't feel that you need to have it. And Rachel has mentioned this. You don't need to have all of the characteristics and all of the competencies, and you don't need to be super competent in all of these areas. This is why it's really important to work um, in teams, in partnership with other organizations, in order to understand how you would upgrade your bicycle uh, to make it go further and faster, better. Um, so it's really important to note that. Um, what's What we'd also like to note is, again, um, the Pacific Climate Change Center, um, they have a training and a training manual around knowledge brokerage, which will enable you to, will, which has tools that enables you to be able to um, um, enhance these competencies as well. Um, so we'd also like to, to note that and that if you want to know more about that, please find Rachel in the virtual booth and she can tell you more about that as well. Um, in terms of climate adaptation. Now we've said that you don't have to be efficient in all of those things, but if you're working on climatic adaptation, it's really important to note that the key competencies in this area are ones around integration, ambiguity, systems thinking, strategic thinking, future thinking, critical thinking, and normative uh, competencies. And that's really interesting to note that in terms of people's feedback and rank rating on how they think they have these uh, these competencies, that these were the ones that, you know, were slightly lower on the scale, but are really important in terms of on terms of adaptation. I also like to think that here in the Pacific, we're very humble. 
and I'm pretty sure that those things are quite uh, ranked higher than than you you know you have put in there. So I'd like to also note that. So yeah, just just making a note of that around the critical skills um, for for adaptation. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Rachel uh, to take us through the next slide around the knowledge brokerage journey. Thank you so much, Nikki. And um, really great to see a lot of responses um, coming through um, that, you know, it's it's really hard to to do self-reflection exercises um, because you, you always feel, you know, a little bit awkward sometimes and, you know, should I should I be doing more of this or should I be doing less of that? Or, you know, what's my neighbor who's sitting next to me um, answering for this exercise? So um, well done to all of you and, you know, really great to see um, so many responses um, as well. Um, I've also noted some questions that have come through um, on the chat. Um, I, I'm not sure how much time um, we'll have to get to all of the questions um, and queries that we have today, um, but also just noting that um, at the end of this presentation, I will share an email address with you. Um, and we do have a booth um, for the PCCC that is set up um, on the platform, on the PRM platform as well. And I will be around um, for the next three days as well and happy, happy to take those discussions um, further. And and yes, um, Elizabeth, uh, it is possible to share this presentation with you. Don't worry. Um, so I've just been reminded that we have about 10 minutes remaining. Thank you, Katie, for that and the, the smiley face at the end of it. Um, but look, um, this this is really this is really something that um, both Nikki and I are very passionate about. Um, we've been working in this space, um, you know, for, for more than 12, 12 years now. Um, and so to us, um, you know, being able to kind of put put words into into what we've been thinking a lot for the past 12 years um, is really something um, exceptional for us. And to be able to share with all of you, um, again, is a privilege as well. Um, so I just I just wanted to go back to this um, picture that I showed earlier, this image that I showed earlier um, of the knowledge brokerage journey. So going from information to knowledge to decision making and action. Um, the first part that I'd like to um, re-highlight is that information is received from a lot of sources. Um, so you'll see at the start of the river, um, at the start of this journey, is that um, you might have a lot of input um, from a lot of people um, that, that can happen um, along this way. And, um, you know, really, really um, challenging to kind of manage um, the, the sources of information that come through and really validate um, whether or not they they are trustworthy and can be acted upon. Um, if you move on to, to look at knowledge, um, so again, you see one path that's kind of coming through, um, you know, and a few more challenges, um, you know, a few more threats um, that are posed along this way. Um, if you if you see um, some of the, I guess, the crocodiles, um, this, this is again um, done by our friends from um, CSIRO uh, in Australia. Um, so if you see some of the crocodiles that exist along the way, these um, these are represent these represent um, some of the challenges that we face. Um, if you move on to decision making, um, Philip, I believe this is where uh, your question came in and, you know, what kind of resourcing um, do we need to actually make the decision happen, you know, or make that action happen on the ground. And that's a very valid question. And, you know, I don't have a standard answer for that. Um, but, you know, I think um, collectively we can kind of, you know, continue to brainstorm, um, you know, what the context is um, of that question moving forward and, and just try and do our best to kind of manage, um, you know, the expectations for that decision and, and the actions moving forward. Um, I'd like to give you a quick example, um, if that's okay. Uh, sorry, Nikki, <laughs> two slides back, please. Um, I'd like to give you a quick example, if that's okay, just in terms of this knowledge brokerage journey um, and the way that it links to the work um, that we do at the Pacific Climate Change Center. Um, so the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, the IPCC um, reports, uh, very scientific. And I'm sure that you've all heard um, IPCC at some point and, you know, kind of wondered why, all right, I'm reading, you know, a hundred plus page document and I'm not really sure how it, you know, applies to my context. That's very valid. Um, so the IPCC reports um, themselves kind of sit um, in the information, um, in the information, um, I guess, box area um, that we have on the, on the journey. Um, what we at the center do is we translate and synthesize a lot of this very technical information into information um, that is 
I guess, understandable and more realistic, you know, kind of answering the so what um, to a lot of questions that we've been receiving. So we turn this information into knowledge. We have produced 15 fact sheets, which also um, of these, uh, sorry, we, we have produced 15 fact sheets, um, which uh, from the IPCC reports from the sixth assessment cycle. Um, and we have um, put them into one pages. So something, something, um, something quick and easy for someone to kind of pick up. They're more visual, less text. And kind of saying like, okay, you know, the key risk areas are X, Y, and Z. Um, what can we do? So going from there, just also like to note that these fact sheets were used by um, Pacific negotiators at various COPs um, since they have been produced. Um, and we're looking at trying to monitor and evaluate um, how that has actually eventuated um, into action on the ground. Thank you, Nikki. Next slide, please. So just going back to the knowledge brokerage journey, knowledge brokerage is not one step. It's not even two steps. Sometimes it can be really challenging, um, you know, to, to get to where you want to be. Um, knowledge brokers exist at different levels. So you can see here um, as an intermediary or a knowledge translator, um, as, a, as a general knowledge broker, as well as an innovation broker. So it the, the spectrum that you see here kind of, you know, gives you a visual representation of, you know, where do my activities sit on this? Enabling access to information and its use, turning that information into knowledge and decision making, or facilitating innovation and change. The one thing I'd really like to note here is that as you go further along the spectrum, the more time, resources, and effort it takes to actually, um, you know, have something concrete on the ground. And, um, you know, I think I've just seen a question come through about how to measure, um, you know, how to measure um, the effectiveness of work on KB, uh, of not, on knowledge brokerage. And that's a very difficult question to ask, uh, sorry, a very difficult question to answer um, because as much as we'd like to give information, um, you know, to various stakeholders, as much as we'd like for them to take that knowledge, we can't guarantee that they'll use it. We can't guarantee that they'll use it to influence policy or decisions or, it to, you know, take it any further. For all we know, um, you know, it, it, could, uh, it could just end up, you know, in a rubbish bin somewhere. Um, so really, some of the part of what we don't have control over, um, again, going back to that ambiguity and, and dealing with uncertainty, um, is also part of the process and, and part of being an effective uh, knowledge broker. Um, but I know we're probably running a little bit out of time. Um, so we have one final um, Mentimeter exercise, please, Nikki, if we could just go into that. Um, so we'd really like to know from all of you, um, which of the following roles, so you've seen, this, um, you've seen this slide here, which of the following roles do you think you take on the most? And if you could just rank it in order of what you think you do the most. So for example, from the first to the fourth. Um, and the, the ones that we talked about is, you know, really enabling um, that information. So being, uh, sorry, enabling that access to information is used. So being an intermediary or knowledge translator, um, turning that information and knowledge into decision-making, being a general knowledge broker, um, facilitating that innovation and change. So more towards the innovation broker. So I see a few responses coming through. This is really great. Um, 11 people have responded so far. We've got four thumbs up. Thank you so much. Um, you've almost made it to the end of this learning lab session with us. Thank you. Um, so it's it's kind of good to see that um, where most of you so far are sitting is um, in the knowledge broker. So turning that information into knowledge and decision making. I see a few more responses coming in. All right, a few more. So knowledge translator, yes. I, I'd also like to highlight here that, um, you know, no no one type of knowledge broker is, is better than the other. We all need each other. Um, you know, it's, it's important to have that information. Without that information, we can't turn it, um, you know, into, into the knowledge that we need to be able to make decisions um, and, and act um, on the ground. Um, okay, so I've just been given a heads up. We have five more minutes. Thank you, Katie. 
Um, okay, so we've had 24 people respond so far, 25, seven thumbs up. This is really great to see. And it, it's it's really great to see that you're all acknowledging, um, you know, that you are knowledge brokers in, in your own respect. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things that Nikki and I would, you know, would like to pass on to you um, from this session as well is that, you know, you don't need the title to be one. You you are one. It just depends where you kind of fit um, in the journey and, and, and what your activities are really involved in. So, um it's it's really really great to see these um responses coming through so 30 people 30 people so far have answered and we've got eight theme uh thumbs up you don't need the title to be one yes talita okay so maybe nikki sorry we'll just go back um to to the last slide um katie maybe i can just get a we have one more uh, mentimeter mapping exercise but um, I'm not sure if we're going to have time for that right now. Apologies. Um, so if I can. Oh, OK. Shall we try for the last Mentimeter? Katie, if I could just get a thumbs up, thumbs down or from you, if we have time to run this quickly. That should be fine. All right, perfect. OK, so our last Mentimeter mapping exercise. So how can knowledge brokers advance climate action and decision making? So the whole theme for the PRM is, you know, really building the resilience of our Pacific people. So this is our last Menti um, exercise for you. Again, the code is the same as before. So how can knowledge brokers advance climate action and decision making? We'd like to open it up to the floor for your for your final comments on this. Thank you. Informed advocacy through evidence provision. Yep. So we have one response, creating awareness, great. Peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and sharing, making information relevant and understandable to communities, listening to our people. Thank you, Nikki, again, for sending um, that in the chat. So we've had five people respond, have a knowledge hub, great. Share information, foster local and regional national engagement, avoiding mistakes from the past. Yep, exactly. Looking at um, lessons learned, best practices, but also noting that, uh, you know, no one size fits all. Even within the Pacific, we're very diverse. Make information open and transparent. Collaborative. Oh. <laughs> Collaborative approaches and sharing of common knowledge and issues. Yep. Cultivate relationships, trust, and connection. So actually, if if I may, um, I'd like to just focus a little bit on that. Building trust takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen within a week, within a month. It can take up to years to build that kind of trust. Um, you know, and, and trust is something that you really need um, in terms of doing um, knowledge brokerage work, but especially uh, within the field of, you know, climate action and, and you know, climate change adaptation and looking at decision making um, based on, on all of this. Engage youth. They already know so much. Very true. Ensuring that views are heard on all sides and that there is mutual understanding and respect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we've had 25 people um, respond and I really don't wanna cut it off, but um, I'm also noting that we have one more minute um, on the clock. Um, so apologies um, if we can't uh, get through everything today, but um, maybe Nikki, we can leave this open for a while longer if anyone else um, wants to contribute um, and then we'll gather the results um, towards the end of this day today. Um, but look, uh, with that, um, with that, um, if I may, just uh, just to conclude this session and just to wrap up um, really quickly, um, on behalf of Nikki and I and, and the center and the team at the Pacific Climate Change Center, please, we just um, really like to express our sincere and deepest thanks um, to all of you for your participation. Um, I know it's a little bit late in the day for some of you, um, and I know that you've been through an intense um, four to five hours of, of PRM. So thank you so much for sticking around. Um, we do have booths available, and um, Nikki, apologies if you can just go to the next slide, please. 
Um, and our email address um, for the PCCC is actually listed there. So if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to contact us directly, um, we're happy. We're happy to take any more questions. And um, again, really, uh, you know, this this session this session was was merely facilitated by Nikki and I. But um, you know, we got so many great responses um, from all of you. So thank you all for being um, such a huge part um, of this. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to close the session and uh, look forward to, to talking more um, with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you, everyone that took part in that session. Um, I think everyone really enjoyed how interactive it was. Um, do join us again tomorrow for the sessions coming up tomorrow. Um, we will see you then. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.